Okay, I'm taking this sound now. Two. Okay. Oh, that's better. I can see the chat. Can somebody in the chat tell me what the audio is like? As long as you can hear me, that's what we need. Two. Ah, good. Thank you, Mackenzie. I appreciate that. Um, and I can see the chat, which is very helpful as well. Cool. So um, this is going to be a very informal talk. Um, less like a TED talk and more like a pep talk. <laughs> so um first thing i'm gonna do is a couple of shout outs to some people that um make all this stuff possible my wife miriam in the office number one um number two like we, we wouldn't be doing any of this um we've had um a couple of weeks of different activities in dunedin and here um and they've all been made possible by the, the, the arts council um the waitaki district council um uh, Targa Museum, which is part of the Dunedin um, Council, the Targa District Council. Um, yeah, so, and I'll better look at my shout outs so I don't forget anybody. Um, there is also um, Kiwi Blues and Roots and New Zealand and Australian Musicians Networking, which is organisations I'm involved in that um, make all the stuff possible and promote all sorts of things, all sorts of bands all over um, New Zealand and um, likes of New Zealand and Australian musicians networking and kind of launch some um, really amazing young artists that um, I'm, I'm not going to um, say any of the names because it sounds like um, as an organisation we're gloating, which we should, we should, but you know who you are um, and, and we, we had some small part at the beginning and um, it's probably a good example of what we're talking about today, so I will actually say the name. Um, amazing being Alien Weaponry, they um, sort of did, screamed and yelled and jumped up and down and said we were going to do big things on um, New Zealand Musicians Networking, and they did. They're still out there doing festival circuits, and they're an amazing band and a great example of um, Kiwi ingenuity. Um, they, they've also got a, an amazing Māori flavour to what they do, and they speak out about... Um, Really great topics like um, mental well-being and things like that. So alien weaponry. Check them out if you like a bit of, bit of loud metal. Um, they also incorporate um, their Māori culture in it. And um, one of these songs got these big heavy riffs and um, mm -hmm. the haka in the middle of it. So um, it's very loud and exciting. Cool. So let's get on a little further with the topic at hand. They were a good example. Um, so if you follow this story, go and, go and have a closer look at what they do. But what I've found, excuse the blasphemy, but this is um, the gospel according to Jay on the music industry. Um, and 
what I've found is different people get different results. So I'm not saying do everything I've done to get there because times have changed with um, technology um, and all that sort of thing. Um, and you know, different people get different results. Your, your, your mind will work in a way that mine doesn't. And, and that's what's really beneficial for everybody in the industry. <clears throat> I'll even learn things from other people that are um, uh, uh, not making a living yet. Um, and, and, and the, you know, we should all be trying to be who we are in this. So anything I say that sounds like old man rambles, try and think of what um, the modern equivalent of sticking posters on walls is. Well, it's pretty obvious that that's social media today because um, of some of the things we did in um, the 90s. I don't know that you're allowed to put things on lampposts in many places in the, in the world anymore because we were... Um, yeah, we were we would put them anywhere, and I hired some young people to put some posters up to promote what we were doing, um, and uh, they they put put them all over this beautiful marble building, and got me into a lot of trouble. <laughs> um, but that's a whole other story. So um, this is one of the hardest industries to to make it as it were that's is a relative term to what what you do um you decide whether you've made it not somebody else um you know and and for me it was it was not about it was never just about the money it's probably more like that now because i have a family to feed and stuff but it was it was more about I spent some years on the unemployment benefit and during those years I really learned to play my guitar and write some great songs and had a really good time with it and could get out could get out there in the industry and and do some stuff. So I made most the most I could of that time but I very quickly grew tired of <clears throat> I believed what I had to do was 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 so important. Um, so, so I had an attitude, a can-do attitude, like a hospitality worker, which is a, um, an industry I worked in for, for a while there. Um, and so I felt the, the being on the unemployment benefit and the like, um, supporting me in that way, was more of a hindrance. We didn't have the um, arts benefits and stuff that are, that are around now. That um, have done amazing things for this country. Um, I felt I think they could, the schemes could be looked at further and increased upon. But um, so so my initial idea was to make the same amount of money <laughs> that I made on the doll, which was wasn't very much. It was um, I think at the time back in um, the nineties, it was like one hundred and thirty five bucks or something. <laughs> um, and so I ended up, what ended up happening by 1996, I started, I really started rolling. I trained in 95 at um, Kuna Te Rangatahi, which was um, a private Māori course, is what, what it was called, um, a PMT or something, private Māori training course. Um, but they did open it up to some... Um, paler followers like me which I was really appreciative of and we we did the hands-on stuff we learned instruments we um, learned the music theory um, we did a little tiny little bit of recording um, mainly because it was only a couple of us that really wrote songs um, it was very much a covers sort of course um, and, and we hit the road and played shows and we had to do the setup and back down. The, the, um, the guy who taught us, I initially thought he was just trying to get us to, to do all the work, but he made sure we knew how to do all of the work. Um, and um, that meant that like all of us had basically stage managed shows, including like 10 peak performers. So, so that was like a huge stepping stone into events and things. Um, so when, when, when I finished that course, I, was, I, was, I felt really lost. Um, and I ended up um, 
rolling into an open mic night because I was trying to do everything I could to still be part of the industry because after an amazing course like that, you actually have to pick it up and use it. Lots of people go through those courses and look like the shining stars of them <clears throat> and then don't do much. Um, it was kind of the case of our course, meaning really only that um, I was the least likely looking to, to get out there and really make it um, or, or make a, a dollar in this industry. So I started going to open mics, um, the folk club, the country club, um, anywhere there was a gig. I'd, I'd, you know, if, if I could see or smell a busker, I'd, I'd be going down and listening and shaking their hands and um, getting to know them, which is um, networking. Um, you, you, really need to get to know people and, and, and even if um, like I'll use myself as an example uh, if, if you meet me at a gig and I'm some funny old fella that seems to know something just bear with these people um, there are cons out there that want to teach you um, get you involved in things that you've got no business being involved in or they're trying to ride your coattails but um be nice to everybody on your way up because you will meet them on the, if, if you have a steady decline. And sometimes the decline is just age and you start moving into other industries where you might be utilising some of those skills. So never forget that you might meet them on the way through. If it's not working well and, and they, they treat you badly, take some self-respect and move on. Um, so while I was cruising around every open mic and annoying everybody, um, <clears throat> I found an open mic that, that really fitted me like a glove and I started going along and there was a drummer there who was probably at about the same level of playing as me so we um, and into the same sort of music. So we, we just started jamming and, and sort of formed a band. Um, bass players came and went. Um, every other week um, and, but we practiced and I ended up living in the hotel um, in, in a big, great big area where I could set up all the equipment and um, I was really just trying to pay for that um, thinking oh how am I going to do this um, and so the barman uh, the bar manager I, I know now that he probably was taking a little bit of advantage of me and um, got me to to do the duty on the person running the open mic and take it over. Um, and, but he asked me to run his open mic where the, the person had bought an open mic to the venue. Um, and I, I still know the guy Steve today. He's um, a very good individual and I, I, I've met him on every side of the industry. <laughs> and he's a good human being and I, I learned a lot of lessons from him. From that, so I took over this open mic started running it and, and and then I was like more annoying. I went around more open mics, more and more and more, just to see how they ran things and what happened. And um, I steadily worked out the things I would do that were different. Like, um, uh, I won't go into this too far because I've got um, a podcast on um, the Song Pipes Corner songwriting page um, and it talks about open mic tips and tricks. Um, you can also find that, that particular podcast on Spotify and places like that. Um, and I soon worked out that, that they were there were clicks. Like you had to be in the cool crowd to, to, to really get a decent slot or you know if they were going to cut someone short and you didn't fit their image, you were the one that was going to get cut off. Um, so um, I learned to, <clears throat> with the attitude of meeting people on the way up that you'll meet on the way down, I, I opened it up to everybody and every poster I had um, after that point always had um, everybody is welcome. Um, you know, and, and we, we've tried to keep to that, even with, we've had some people come along to open mics that, that was, is not ready as I was when I started, you know, like I really wasn't ready to be doing that stuff, but I, I've now opened the doors to those people a, a lot better. And some of them have gone on to do great things as well. So, um, so the open mic led into other, um, 
other events. So I started getting into um, running, we ran the Battle of the Bands. Um, I was doing my own shows and shows with other people. Um, and after a while, like of doing this stuff and, and really just trying to do anything I could within the point in the industry I was. There was a cap and the cap was um, my own ability to, to learn new stuff. I didn't even know how to learn, to be honest, when I look back. Um, so, <clears throat> always be re-educating yourself and, and, and look for things, resources like this, where you find out how other people have done things. Um, so, all your skills in the music industry are transferable and they're monetizable. So, just to continue my story a little, um, and when, I, when I'm done with that, I'll go into the nitty gritty of a few things about how to um, how to really get yourself out there and lots of different ways you can do it. Um, and again, these things are all really um, transferable into a modern technological age that we live in today. So, um, as I said, I, I, I didn't know how to learn or get further. I just... Bigger events scared the heck out of me, despite the fact I, I had this absolute delusion that I was 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 going to make it. I, I was delusional about the level of my ability, and but that that was it wasn't good for the people having to listen to me. I, I would say, but I for me it meant I just kept doing it and I put in the hard yards. But then um, I went. My dream was to go to the Nelson School of Music. It's called something else now, um, Nelson Academy of Performing Arts or something. I don't know. Um, but it was my dream to go there. I'd, I'd read stuff about it and I'd just seen articles and just went, that is for me, that's, that's, that's a cool place to go. So I went um, and I put together my application, um, a video application, and I suddenly realised I was too late and was about to send it when um, my girlfriend at the time, she got her acceptance to the um, Nelson Polytechnic for, for an arts course. So <clears throat> I was like, so, so I followed her up there thinking, oh, well, I'll, I'll meet some of these people in the industry there and try it in an even smaller town and try and do some of the open mics and things I was doing. Um, and when I got there, um, you know, and I, I, I say this in a good way, it's going to sound rude, but um, <laughs> the, the, the girlfriend at the time was quite pushy in a good way um, uh, on this occasion. Um, and she, she said, get out of the car and march your enrolment in there. You never know. And I learned a lot from that because I waltzed in and they had me waiting for like an hour and a half. Um, and the guy that was there was the um, guitar, songwriting, music theory tutor, um, Mark Jensen, one of my favourite people in the world. I wouldn't be doing anything in this business if it wasn't for that man, I don't think. Um, well, I wouldn't be how it looks today. I learned so much from him. And so I caught the right person, I believe, because the other tutor um, had been everywhere. Like Mark had played in Mondo Rock and bands like that and had um, uh, some reasonable chart hits and recording hits and toured with some great people that, like there's a kinship of people from um, Daddy Cool and um, other big Australian bands. Uh, he, he, there's a lineage between those bands. So, um, <clears throat> He'd kind of done a lot, but the other guy had been international and he didn't kind of, he wasn't a songwriter, so he didn't see what I had, um, whatever that was at the time. But, but Mark saw it and he believed in me since, since day one and, he, and I knew it on that day. Um, and, and he called up the, the head of the course, whose real say it was, to come and look at this video because he believed in something I was doing. It wasn't my singing or my guitar or I don't, I don't know what he saw but he believed 
um, and he still does to this day and he really often tells me I have always believed um, and I'm grateful you need people like that in your life stick with those people um, so I ended up he, he convinced I don't know if he wrestled Warren the head of the course to, to convince him to give me a go but then when we got <clears throat> I left the building in tears, just happy tears, um, and it was it was amazing, really amazing. And I learned so much in the year I was there. Um, the early course I did, I did twice because I loved it so much. I really wish I could have done that dozens of times. <laughs> it was amazing. So we 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 were educated really well, and I learned lots more about how I learn. Um, and so we did songwriting courses, we did um, um, performance classes, we did all the things you really want. It was, it was, I, we were spoiled, man. We were so spoiled. Um, and then we went on tour and during the recording classes, our recording tutor, I think he had burnout. I think he burnt out because he was running some venues and some other stuff as well. So. <clears throat> We kind of lost him, but but we'd had enough from him and another guy on the course who was, was just a bit of a legend, really. He kind of knew lots of stuff and became the tutor after we finished, after he graduated. Um, <clears throat> so we were given free reign in the studio. So, so that was just an amazing time. So by the time I got to... I left Nelson, I went to Christchurch for about, maybe about a year, up to a year. Um, and so I did some stuff in Christchurch, playing open mics and helping run one, open, helping run a venue. And then people were pushing me to manage bands because of my ex experience on that side of things. But I still wanted to play. I was young enough that I still wanted to play. I was only 23 or 4. And I still wanted to be out there, but I wanted to do everything. I just wanted to do everything. I didn't see myself managing a band, and I couldn't work out why. Um, and I, I've, I've really never fully managed a band. I've, I've, um, for a while there, I, I was educating a young youth band, that, um, but, but it really wasn't for me. Or, or for them long term, I, I expected something that they, they weren't willing to give at that stage. And they're all still in the industry today. They're amazing musicians. Um, um, so I moved back to Dunedin and realised it was venues that I, I, I really wanted to do events and run venues. And I just made lists of the things I could do. Um, and that's never stopped. I'm still writing lists about how to redevelop the things I do and, and, and find new and novel approaches. Um, <clears throat> so 2003, I studied at um, Targa University at the time, um, uh, during this time as well, and um, I, I learned a lot there. Um, uh, was a different form of learning, like um, I hadn't learned to self-motivate it in the same way, so did find that quite hard in comparison um, where the, the courses I'd done before were more organic and they were hands on and they, they get annoyed with me if I wasn't doing stuff. Um, varsities don't behave like that, they fail you if you don't live up to what they need <laughs> most of the time, generally speaking. Um, so I found that I found that really difficult um, and, and I, I just was doing so much at the same time. I ended up running venues and playing gigs and um, putting together events and while I was running venues I got my liquor license that meant that <clears throat> a CV that didn't look very appetizing because I'd, I'd worked at the warehouse briefly um, and um, yeah, that's about all I'd done that, that was employed um, by other people so I didn't have a CV to speak of so when I got my liquor license it, it, it means you're the it's a general manager's license, is what it's called. So on the CV, people are like, oh, you were in management. And, and effectively, as, as entertainment management goes, I was. And then I learned the liquor licensing side. Um, 
So I utilised that to move myself forward. And, and while running several venues in Dunedin and um, putting on showcases and things, I, I really got to experiment with um, the different things I could do. So when I stopped running the venues, because I, I, this is where I learned about what a musician actually does. Um, so musicians are majority independent contractors. So we haven't got a permanent contract with the venue. We roll in, do our what we said we'll do, and leave. Um, so that means if they treat you badly at the venue, play nice. Don't don't be don't be um, walked on either. Um, be strong. But if, if, if they're going to treat you bad, you just you're not going back there. You, don't, you just don't need to. Um, so I learned that <clears throat> valuing myself in, as, as the product was far more important than um, pushing and pushing and pushing and, and using that insatiable appetite. Um, and I wasn't employed by those people. They, I was contracted by them. So I'm like a, a plumber coming in. You don't tell the plumber how to plumb the toilet. Um, so I learned though that value within that um, and sort of a I also learned like a punk rock attitude about how to um, how to conduct business if, if you know anything about punk rock they didn't really know how to play their instruments but they kept going and, they, and so what we took that to was um, posters and, and the like trying to get the word out there <coughs> we would make our own posters with whatever was available um, so I, my, the first posters of my, my first band, we, um, <laughs> the poster had a little piece of paper that was white on a photocopier so that there was a white spot. And I had long hair at the time and I stuck my face in the, so there was hair and the light just looked terrifying like something out of a horror film <laughs> and, and the white bit I could write in there what the venue was and the date and the time etc um, so the pretty average sort of posters they do I've still got one they look pretty gnarly in some ways if you could do a digital version of the same thing it was, it was probably quite creative um, and then we we couldn't afford glue we spent all our money on um, photocopying or using um, Friends that, that had businesses or um, churches and things like that to print some posters and we would do that in several places so we could get a, a hundred odd, 150 posters for a small city like Dunedin and, and, and stuck them up. We realised we couldn't afford glue. We were like, what are we going to do? Um, you know, um, so what we, we ended up doing was we made glue out of flour and water, which leaves a real mess so lots of people weren't very happy with us about <laughs> the way we did it where wallpaper um, paste is pretty cheap and, and like you, that will um, not look so grimy and messy um, probably suited our posters but you know we, we learned a lot from there um, about running from the smell of an oily rag like use what you've got um, so that, that brought me to a place where I got out there and instead of running a venue and being paid as a bar manager and entertainment manager, um, which earned me for the so three nights a week, Friday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday sort of thing, I could actually earn slightly more money than that by going and running several events a week. So I was playing four to five nights a week um, or running something four to five nights a week. I ran open mics in, in several different places and do acoustic nights and songwriter nights. All sorts of things like that. Anything to turn a buck, really. Um, and and, and it, it worked um, and it slowly increased as I got better at this. Um, to the point where I started working in theatre and started realising um, how drama people really do things was a 
little bit different than us. They were far less punk rock and um, way more um, rooted in their education and their craft. And I had to learn a lot about showmanship from them and, and how they conducted business because they, they were predominantly independent contractors as well. So it's the same type of field. And I think that's something, one thing for any business um, person, um, especially in this particular business, um, you need to realize we're not working at the warehouse anymore. <laughs> you know, like you might still work at the warehouse to, to get yourself moving. And that's each to their own on that one. Um, <clears throat> but you're not working for the warehouse anymore, as it were. You, you are now, you have your own business and, and believe in it that way and start pushing as if you are. Um, and that's, that's kind of brought me to a place, so I'm going to wrap up my, my life story here in music. Um, you know, like, started in 1995, so I'm coming up 30 years <laughs> um, doing this. And, and now I run an entertainment agency, music school, um, and we do all sorts of things. We monetize um, all sorts of things. Um, so so we... we, we we teaching is a big profit earner. Um, I've been on the road for, for all those years, especially the last 12 years. I, I was just on the road constantly. Um, I moved back to Ongaru with, with my um, amazing wife, who's also a musician, and very understanding. That's, um, it's, you really need um, to partner with someone who gets it. So she, because she's a musician, we still wanted to have children, do all the, the family thing, but she understood what I was needing to do to, to make us the living. Um, and I've slowed down now. I can't see. Uh, uh, road life is um, can be pretty rough. There'll be a whole other talk one day um, or on one of my podcasts about how to look after yourself on the road. Um, anyway, so so... Now I've got a fully functioning business that, that makes me a proper living um, and I can support my family. Um, and it hasn't always been easy to get to that place. Um, so so let's, let's go back a bit and talk um, some finer details about how you can do this because my story is unique to... Um, my era, as in the 90s, we didn't have social media. Um, so we will talk a little bit about social media um, and a little bit of a whole bunch of things of, of that you can invest in. So let's, let's go back a step to the type of entrepreneurs you need to be to 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 to. to really make a living in this business. Um, I'll use three case in points um, and I hope I hope I um, reach you and your, your um, where you are today with these people. If I don't, go and research the real story behind the people you admire, the musicians, the entertainers that you think are just incredible. Even if it's actors, you'll find people like Dwayne Johnson have a um, Quite a story that got him to, to be one of the most successful people um, Hollywood has ever seen. Um, and, and the reason he calls uh, his production company Five Buck Productions is because he got down to that was every cent he had and he didn't think he could, he didn't know what to do next. And, and, and he turned it into the multi million dollar corporation he runs today, you know. Um, but he wasn't one of my case studies. The, the three I've chosen, uh, um, two of them are country singers, come pop and funk, and Ed Sheeran, who's, who's, who's sworn his next album's going to be country, which will be very interesting. But there's one th that they have certain things in common, just like everybody else that came before them that are remembered. Um, 
there's a thing called, I don't know if, you, if, if any of you know the song Cult of Personality. It's by a band called Living Colour. Um, they're an incredible band and they told an amazing story with this, their, their biggest, biggest hit. Um, um, it's worth going and listening to and, and understanding what it is they're talking about. There's a great interview with CM Punk, who's a professional wrestler who um, uses it as his theme song and he explains why. Because he, he got the formula is that Mussolini and, and all those, those great people from history, um, the, the great Abe Lincoln, um, all those people, they, they had one thing in common and it was this um, the cult of personality, like they were insatiable, they decided that this is what they're going to do. Um, you can, I, I saw an interview from, I think it's an American show called Nightline, I think it was, um, and it was old, like with Taylor Swift, um, and she wasn't famous yet, she was. Um, just starting to record, I think she'd written some of her first album um, and she sits there in the seat and plays some of her now iconic songs but they pull out her yearbook from years before, she was she was basically a, a, a child at the time, she was only 16 or 17 in this interview and then at 14 her yearbook, her quote said something about um, I'm going to be an international pop star when I grow up. And, and she knew, she knew then. And you can see it in this interview. You can tell she's going to <clears throat> do something amazing with it. Moving on to Born Here in New Zealand, which is, uh, so if you're watching from New Zealand or Australia, um, we both resonate um, as countries with this guy amazingly. Mr. Keith Urban, one of the greatest um, songwriters of the modern era, um, he's written with some amazing people and he's um, mm -hmm. creatively done some amazing things. But he decided that um, when he was really young, he was going to do it. He was going to up and do this. He tried a bit here um, and um, he just knew it wasn't going to be an easy path to base himself here in New Zealand. So he, uh, maybe his family moved him over to Australia, so he got a little bit more of an edge that way. But he even knew over there, he looked around him, and, and I've seen an interview with him, look at interviews with these people, and they'll, they'll, you'll see documentaries and things, show just what they were capable of doing and why they, they just were not going to back down. Keith Urban looked around and realised the country music that goes on at the time here in New Zealand um, and in Australia, which is cultivated and grown a little, probably in thanks huge part to things he's done. They, he looked around and it was like a <laughs> dueling banjos kind of country, not, you know, like um, this was in the mid 90s and he was looking around and seeing Garth Brooks jumping up and down on, uh, on the drum kit and uh, doing crazy things. That, that was not going to be um, go so well in, in country venues in, in um, Australia. So he looked around, he looked at his band, he knew he had a good band and he did a couple of television things and just went, no, I'm out of here. Went to America, moved to Nashville, Tennessee, which is like the mecca of country music. Now it's just the mecca of music. It's really a music city. And that took um, some real courage coming from a, a, a Kiwi-born boy, brought up in Australia mostly. Um, it took a lot. It took a lot to actually pick up and, and believe in yourself that much. And, and then he did the work if you watch those interviews. Ed Sheeran, I don't know if um, a lot of people know this because he's always... Keith Urban didn't always say he was from New Zealand or Australia. He just got out there and was being a songwriter. Um, Ed Sheeran is still renowned for being British. He's, he's a British entertainer. 
But he moved to America before he had a big hit because he knew he needed to move and shake in those areas. So picking up that ball and really running with it um, will get you more results. Um, having a, a, the, the courage to, to move if you need to. Um, so this is one of the hardest industries ever to make money. Um, someone else in entertainment, I met a guy, um, he was uh, uncle of um, a girl that lived, a young girl that lived with us for a while, who um, I used to refer to as my foster daughter, she's, a, she's an amazing young lady, um, and her uncle would come and visit, and then when he realised I was in entertainment, he, he like he was on... Um, He'd been on Shortland Street TV shows and movies and um, quite a lot of ads that you probably know. He was one of the original Mighty Teen Ad guys before um, before the Big is Better guy. Um, and so he said to me, he said, Jay, I've got a bit of advice for you about the entertainment industry. I said, yeah, please, please, go, go, tell me. <coughs> and he said, thing you've got to work out is this business is no money or silly money. And I didn't totally get what he meant because me being one-eyed and insatiable with uh, that cult of personality thing, I thought he meant, okay, now you're not earning much money, but you're going to earn big money. It's not what he meant. Um, and I had to learn this the hard way. He was talking about budgeting. So... When you start getting gigs, as we a lot of people learnt in the pandemics, didn't go back to gigging because they were like, this could all fall on, on top of us and it could be all over. Um, and it could have been for lots of people, companies, organisations. Um, but what he was saying was, you get a gig, especially in the, the, their acting field, um, you might make a decent amount of money and then be a month where you're not earning money. So don't go and buy a new car as soon as you... If that's the investment you're going to make, think it through clearly the investments you're going to make with your vehicle and equipment. And, um, but you've got to pay the rent, you've got to do all those things. Um, cool. And... Uh, Anything can be monetized that, that you can do in this industry. Um, so I made money doing a bunch of things. I'm going to list a bunch of them just so you get an idea. Um, I'd be, if I was sitting on the other end of this um, talk, I'd be writing down possibilities that came to mind as I was learning this. So, um, so obviously I talked about open mic. Uh, I now do podcasts about all sorts of things, um, showcases, contests, teaching. I worked as an advisor to festivals and ev events, running these fe some of these festivals and events, um, being a DJ, which software is out there that's free, that is good enough to use live. Um, I've played agent, I've managed and mentored artists, uh, recording other people. Um, selling my own recordings, running karaoke events, um, and funding. Just like, I'll well, shout out to, to the Arts Council who have funded a lot of the stuff for the, the conference weekend that we were in the middle of. Um, learning how to leverage funding to do more, where if, if you think about it, like I'm networking with the people that are watching this, and, and all those people as well as being paid to, to do this and paying other people and, and um, enabling other people on the process, which is, is important to how I do things. Because um, as I meet these people and then I hear that how, where they're at as a performer, they either become a, they could become a student or they could be, be ready to go and I'll put them in a showcase. And, and then, then I'm enabling them while making um, some coins myself. And they're 
building mm. into, and learning how to make a living or making money at the same time. So the tutors that are working for us this weekend, they're all earning um, uh, a nice wage for this one. Like we, we've got to a place where we can pay these people well. So I always pay um, someone their worth. Um, so every one of those skills uh, um, leverageable. Um, this is a big one, jam with people and connect. So networking, we used to talk, before it was um, uh, social media, which is, uh, you know, again, a whole nother topic that really frustrates me um, and, and excites me as well. <laughs> um, so social networking is what it used to be called because musicians and other forms of businesses would use it much like um, LinkedIn is used now, but then it's just, LinkedIn is just the professionals. Well, it's arguable too, but I mean, the idea is that it's just the professionals. But social media in general is about networking still. So getting marketing, getting your voice out there, and networking. Don't forget to network. Um, <coughs> and joining clubs like the musicians clubs, the clubs and societies, folk clubs, country clubs, those sort of things and get to know people in them because they're allies that will help you when you need it um, and, and be ready to do them favours. A moment while I get a drink. Um, And I remember a statement um, my pastor made once at a, at a workshop we were doing for our worship team, which is a, an amazing environment to, to learn and um, to teach. Um, but he said, are you teachable to, to the group? And we all had to, oh, I, yeah, I, I'm teachable. Um, I was cheeky and and asked him if he was teachable as well, <laughs> um, which is naughty. But um, <clears throat> no matter where you are on the food chain um, or whatever, you can learn from other people. So you should spend your career, learn, 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 and, and really look for those educational tips, play um, talks like this, um, reading books, watching documentaries, like watch everything um, on, on playing, on, on industry. Um, <clears throat> those documentaries on artists that have made it um, are really worth every, every penny you can, you can spend on them. Half of them are available free. Um, yeah, you, you'll also find, if you look carefully on YouTube, YouTube's a a hard place to um, find good stuff but once you get educated on it um, you'll find things I go to and this is this is a huge tip to anybody um, Berkeley University and probably lots of the other ones like Harvard and places like that will, will do it as well Berkeley um, instead of those open lectures they used to do where you could just roll in and just see one lecture and um, if they saw you too many they wouldn't let you in again <laughs> um, Berkeley, which is one of the most renowned music universities in the world, they, they um, um, John Mayer went there is a really good example of a great entertainer that um, has been everywhere and done everything. And he learned his tricks there, now he lectures there. But, and you, you can see his lectures and the people that trained him, which is a whole other echelon of, of um, educators. If you're interested in songwriting, go to the Berkeley site and look for everything you can find on Pat Patterson. Not Pat Patterson, the wrestler, um, but Pat Patterson is a songwriting guru, as it were. Um, he's really worth looking at. So, um, And look around. When you, when you find people that you think you can trust and they've got the good knowledge and good technique, um, their, their thumbs not hanging off the fretboard and telling you to <laughs> use the wrong appendages to play notes. You know, when you find someone that's trustworthy, subscribe to the channel because this stuff's going to pop up all the time. 
um, and, and, and my pet peeve, um, I hear lots of people over the years have come to me and said, oh, I'm a trained singer. Trained as a word is past tense. Um, so it sets alarm bells off for me because normally I'm a trained singer. They come into the environment and they're not ready for the environment they're in a lot of the time when they speak that way. Um, if they say I'm a trained singer and I'm playing in such and such a band every night in, in whatever place, you know, you, you go, okay, well, you're using it, so that muscle is still going. When we're training, like if, you, if, you, if you're a harrier, a runner, you want to go to um, um, a marathon, you don't just get up that morning and go on a marathon and have not been training for it. It's the same thing. We need to pick up our skills and roll. I've even seen um, some of the great rock and roll bands of all time. Um, yeah. Guns N' Roses of recent years um, are one of the, the most rehearsed bands ever, but the live performance is another, a whole other animal. So the first shows of the new tours, I wouldn't go and see them till like show number five or six, and then they're on fire, their first shows. You can watch all those um, bands online all the time now, so like... Um, I've now been following those acts and seeing their progression over a tour. And they, um, they've they done really, really well with um, um, growing as an act and pushing um, new material, but they're not afraid to keep working toward it, which is that punk rock attitude. So remember, train, train, train. Um, Venues, like don't be scared to go knock on doors of venues. Um, I, I remember I when I started trying to get gigs, um, I didn't even know what this was. It turned out I, I, I got um, a bit of anxiety, which a lot of people do, and you'll find people with anxiety, like real <sighs> engulfing um, anxiety, find tools on how to get around it. I remember trying to book gigs and being terrified. Um, and I'd walk around the block. I'd go to the front door and I'm still not ready. I'd walk around the block again, around the block again. And then eventually when I'd worked myself up to it, I, I'd burst in the door and go, give me a gig! <laughs> and so um, I would get gigs. I don't know if they were scared of me, but... Um, you know, like, the worst thing they can say is no. Well, that's not a hard thing to hear. Um, and it doesn't have to be the last time you ask them either. Like, if you go all the way around your town or city and they all say no, go around again in a wee while, you know, and, and prove to them that you're um, going to be around forever because musicians... Um, which is why music teaching can be hard to build a business in as well as because musicians can be so transient that they, um, they're, people aren't sure they're going to be around. So after many years, I get a lot more work these days because they know I'm going to be around. Um, that, that I'll end up a very old man in this business, I would say. Um, and then I think most people kind of realise that in uh, places that I uh, would be trying to get work. Um, and weird and wacky places to play. Like, people are always saying to me, well, you, you play all those weird places. What's the deal there? And I'm like, um, and you you just wait five years or ten years. And now, like, I remember playing museums and um, art galleries and... Um, Polytechs and universities, um, and and now that's that's like a thing in my hometown. It's like they have um, entertainers on a regular basis at, at the Tiger Museum, the um, Early Settlers Museum. I'm not sure the new name of that. It's got, it's got a beautiful Maori name, um, and 
And like that's a normal thing. And now they do lectures and things in there as well, talks like this. Um, so there's, there's, don't be afraid to try those things. Like I've, I've played events where I'm just um, playing in, in a garden somewhere, you know, or the public gardens or um, um, fancy places where they do um, weddings and stuff. But just playing open days and playing in the gardens or, or by the waterfall or, you know, like really strange things. Busking is a, is a, is a, is a good way to make extra dollars. There's some way of monetizing anything you do. <clears throat> and I hope you've written a list of these um, things you can do. Um, and, and don't be afraid to send things through to me. Um, I, I'm happy to talk to people um, and I'll, I'll try, to, try my absolute best to find the time to, um, to talk to you about all these things. Um, as, as part of what I do as a mentor um, anyway so um, all right and real experiences on stage like um, we, there was a saying when I first got in the industry um, I remember people walking off stage at open mics and going <gasps> and, I, and it became this saying around town like I know you play like Jimi Hendrix and you'd be drunk and it's so true for a lot of people like you you gear up and you go, yeah, I'm ready for that stage. And then there's people looking at you. <laughs> and it's like, what do I do now? Um, so so you, you get the nerves, you get the, and you, you don't know how that's going to affect you. So the real experience is on stage. Um, so I'll be quietly closing some of the stuff up with just a few, few more tips. Um, always turn up. Um, an unforgivable sin in most entertainment, um, whether it be acting, musicians, um, professional wrestlers have the same thing, which is entertainment, by the way, which is why I keep mentioning it, because I've learned a lot of tricks from that. You can find resources in lots of different places in entertainment that will come back to what you do as a, as a musician or a songwriter or um, many different things. But it's the unforgivable sin to not turn up to a gig you've been advertised for. So letting people down is, 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 is not going to get you the next gig. It's going to have people turn their noses up at your name. And um, I think we only get so many shots at, at that sort of thing because um, I definitely made some mistakes on those fronts early on, but you only get so many um, pass go cards. <laughs> um, all right, yeah, if you advertise, and, and, and that doesn't mean like if something seriously has actually gone wrong. Um, not life or death situations, um, that, that sort of thing is, is, is acceptable. Um, always leave extra time for set up or for something to go, so in case something goes wrong. Everyone wants to talk to you while you're setting up. If you're running the event, the last 20 minutes will be people messaging you saying, oh, what time is your talk today, Jay? That, that's not a dig of anyone who asked me today what time it was. But that's, that's what happens at events and things. If someone's going to be asking you when it is, oh, am, am I supposed to bring this and I'm supposed to do that? Mm -hmm. that's, and that's normal with events. So you need that time up your sleeve. Um, communication. So... Always respond to the communication you have. Behave like a business person. My old boss, Hilary Beaton, she was incredible. She was very hard on me. <laughs> there was times I didn't like her and she didn't like me, but I learned so much from her because she had all these things like, like uh, answer questions in a timely manner. 24 hours is too long when you reach 24 hours. That's way too long. Um, you'll lose a gig. If someone needs to fill that gig and they're on a deadline, they want an answer right then, sometimes. Um, and, and <clears throat> but it's just, again, how you build your reputation to, to know that you're reliable and you're going to be around. Um, 
Oh, social media. I said we'd talk more about social media, and I haven't really done a lot of that. But um, some of you will know more about social media than me. I will we'll do another talk on social media. Don't be afraid to push people's buttons and and, and share on social media. Um, some people get really antsy, like you've kicked their cat. <laughs> Excuse the expression, but. They can change their notifications. It's, it's a really immature approach to, to be annoyed with a business person advertising their business. Lots of people think that if, if you're advertising for something, oh, it's not filling up, there's not enough people. There's, that's not true. McDonald's have never stopped advertising and they never will. They will annoy us for years to come. Every time you're about to watch a movie, you will have that Justin Timberlake, I'm loving it, at the beginning of, of the movies or whatever, um, ads on YouTube or, um, yeah. So, yeah, and last but not least, the last two things, um, each to their own, everyone's going to get different results. Um, if you know what a niche is, a niche is like just narrowing down to the thing that makes you really, really individual. That works for some people, doesn't work for everyone. If you're trying to be a business person in this business and you want to make a living out of it, niche is not required or even good advice for some people. Um, as a startup business, you might have to do lots of different things. Um, I'm trying not to be cheeky here. Um, people um, don't understand what we do as, as, as musicians or entertainers or um, business people or entrepreneurs. Um, lots of people won't get it, but they'll get it later and go, how are you like the only person who can, seems to, this is only a certain amount of people that make a full-time living out of playing music. And they're not necessarily all the great, I know musicians that are way better than me, but, but but I take what I do into that and I, I on a social like we talked about. Um, so so take advice, listen to advice and filter it where necessary. Just like those YouTube channels where they're um, doing very strange things. If it looks weird, it's probably not quite right. If, if their fingers are going the wrong direction, if they're not all in lines and if they don't make it look easy they're probably doing it wrong you know so um, um and the last but not least don't listen to other people's negativity um and what i mean by that is people will naysay you use it as fuel for the fire um There's always someone who's, um, I try not to get personal on these things, but I always do. Um, my stepfather used to always, and he was just being funny, um, but I took everything very seriously when I was younger, which you, you have to learn not to. But <clears throat> he used to always, he was, he was, his humour was cruel, really. He used to say, he, I'd be singing in my room and he'd be like, it's all right, Jamie. We'll, we'll call it. The ambulance is on its way. Like, I sounded like I was in pain. Um, and I probably did. But, <laughs> um, but, but that fueled me. It, it angered me so badly. It fueled me into a place that meant I was, I was the character in the Linkin Park songs to do something and, and be anything but what you want me to be, to quote the song you know um and so so like those things can be helpful but also don't take it all too seriously when people are like that learn not to be offended by it i remember a guy at the end of a, one of the courses i had to do he made the statement he was talking to everybody individually as a goodbye at the end of the course and pinpointed me and said jay the music will come. I took, he meant like, he believes in me, that it's going to be 
awesome. I'm going to reach the heights I'm looking for. But I took it that I wasn't there yet. In my, um, in my head, I was there. <laughs> so I took it the wrong way and, and it really upset me. And I didn't need to. I needed to take his encouragement and go, thank you, I really appreciate that. And, you know, like, you need people to believe in you. And not everyone will. Don't expect them to do it the way you want them to. Um, I had a couple of mentors that were a husband and wife. He was amazing. He, he, he died before he could really get to see me out doing it. But he gave me my first guitar and he was just, uh, just a pearl of wisdom. That man, Rusty. Um, and his wife... She inspired me because she was the singer and guitarist, that's what I became, and he was a bass player, but he had the personality to, to, to give and nurture, like he should have been a music teacher himself. He would have been amazing. Um, and she wasn't, that wasn't her personality, and, and it used to hurt me because she never came to shows. She's, I still don't think she's ever seen me um, <laughs> perform live. And she used to be like, she heard my first album and, and, and there's a thank you to her and her husband in it. Um, and, and she was quoted to saying to, to my mother when she gave her the, uh, the free cassette I'd sent to them, cassette tape, an audio cassette tape, if you don't know what that is, research it. <laughs> so that was the format that uh, the music came out on at the time. And, and she got a free copy of the tape of my first album called um, One True Thing by Jay and the Rebels. Um, and she listened to it, and she said, but that's not country. So what does that got to do with it? So don't let the negativity bring you down, and in fact, don't take offence to it. Sometimes use it for fuel, but don't um, take it all the wrong way either. Don't take yourself too seriously. Um, so that brings us to the end. We've gone um, well over. This was meant to be a 40-minute talk but it's um, um, 65 minutes so thank you so much and don't be afraid to fire questions through later um, I will be around and I will um, really look forward to hearing from you um, if you've got questions any of you that have my email address or um, message the, the site you're watching this on I monitor all of them, like I said, with social media. Don't be on the social media if, you, if you're not going to respond. Um, always, you know, if, if you don't like Twitter, get off Twitter if, you, if you're not going to respond to people or, or tweet either. If you're not going to use it, don't be on there because it just looks like you're, you're not active as a, as, a, as a business. So, cool, thank you, and um, please um, fire through um, any questions. Um, this feed and you can personally message me on on Ken to, to chat with people who um, engaged with this and, and really enjoyed it. So thank you and last but not least I thank you again to the sponsors um, the New Zealand Arts Council Arts Council New Zealand um, and um, the Waitaki District Council who um, have a, an Arts Council office and they made this happen um, so Thank you so much and um, I will see you around. Cheers. Bye.